Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Elevators as security risks. What goes up may let you down. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Deviant Olam, Security Auditor and Penetration Testing Consultant with the Core Group. If during the webcast you have any questions for Deviant, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Deviant. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. This should be a fun topic for those of you who have never seen me talk about elevators before. It is, it is an interesting subject indeed. It's one that's disregarded a lot in terms of security posture. But why are we talking about this today? Who, who are we, the elevator hackers, and how did we come by this? Well, as I was introduced by SANS, I am Deviant Olaf. I am one of the lead penetration testers at the core group, which focuses on physical attacks and physical covert entry. My associate on all of this research was the wonderful Howard Payne. He is an elevator consultant and inspector. He is a security guy, and he is a, a real killer at the poker table also, i got to tell you. But why did we talk about this? Well, we'll get into that after a brief word of warning. Elevators in general are very safe, even in the biggest city in this country, New York, which has more elevators than any other city in this country. There are many trips with very few injuries. Throughout our whole country, only about you know, a couple dozen people experience a, a fatal interaction with an elevator in a year. Almost all those are trained professionals working on the devices at the time, in the hoistway or the pit. Now that is not to say that you can't get grievously injured by an elevator mishap. Do not screw around with what you're about to see if you haven't been trained properly in the use of elevators. Likewise, you might think yourself smart enough that, oh, well, I'm not going to get pinched in between floors and die. Still, don't mess around with a lot of this content if you don't know what you're doing because it's very easy to damage an elevator system, cause it to fail, cause it to stop. You could entrap yourself. You could cause a lot of, you know, you could be facing a criminal mischief charge if you cause enough dollar value and damage or stoppage. So please bear all that in mind. But why, if these are such, you know, interesting machines, why go into this at all? Well, you're about to see in this webcast that elevators have a very big application to building and facility security. They are used as part of a building security in some installations. And in my opinion, in Howard's opinion, they should not be relied on as security devices really in any substantial way. For those of you who've never looked at anything except the inside of an elevator when you ride in one, a little bit of background for you. There are essentially two types of elevators in use in the world today. There are what are called overhead traction elevators, seen on the left here. That's where you have a large, um, a large rotating uh, drum system on the top that is actually hauling the elevator up and down, balanced by a counterweight. So all of the impetus, all of the force is coming from the overhead. And on the right side, you see sort of the slightly cheaper, slightly slower, and very common and smaller building style of elevator. That's a hydraulic elevator. That's where all of the driving force takes place, usually down in the pit or near the pit, with a hydraulic pump that is pushing up from below. But in each case, the elevator itself, the car in which you ride, does not have its own motor other than, you know, a door operator to open and close those cabin hoistway doors. The elevator is being driven up and down by means of technology in the motor room. Here we see an overhead traction motor room. Again, big winch type systems. They're connected to motor generators. They're, they're running up there. A hydro setup, hydraulic motor room, not as sexy. Let's be honest. It's a hydraulic tank and a little box on the wall. Speaking of that box on the wall, this is where we start getting into the nitty gritty of how the elevators go where they want to go or where you want them to go. Whether you're talking about a traction elevator or a hydraulic elevator, there's always going to be a control cabinet in or near the motor room. This controller, which is, you know, they have really old ones, Relay Logic is still installed in some buildings, old enough installations, but for the most part, you're talking about microcontrollers making logic decisions based on inputs. So this elevator 
is going to take your input as a user, for example, at the fixtures that are located both on the car operating panel and at the hall buttons. It'll take inputs from these fixtures and it will choose where it's going to drive. Now, you are not the only controller of the elevator. You're not the only one dictating what the controller sees. The controller has a lot of other inputs. Most of them are related to the position and speed of the elevator. Here we see what are called limit switches. These roller switches as the elevator is nearing the end of its travel, it'll hit some slow down switches. There's slow down one, slow down two, and then the platforming limit, the upper limit. You notice there's a fourth one in here. That's called the final limit. If the elevator completely goes, goes awry and runs off you know, the end of its travel, it'll hit a final limit at the top or bottom of the hoistway, and that'll stop everything really fast. And then you need a tech to come out and reset things and get it working again. When the elevator's traveling up and down in the hoistway, this, we're looking at a car top here. And on the car top, there is something called the selector. There are a number of different styles, but this one just is a magnetic sensor that's running along essentially a large magnetic tape. And this selector is reading position information. So the controller at all times should know where the elevator is, where the cab is positioned in the hoistway. It should know what it's doing, if it's overspeeding, if the elevator is running too fast, it will either electronically or even, in this case, you can mechanically trigger governors, rope grippers, things that will apply brakes and stop the elevator from traveling unsafely. And if all else fails, this is our little section about safety because people are often worried that they'll get hurt in elevators when elevators are very safe, as we said. If all else fails, if the elevator just does not stop going downward, it will hit this pit buffer. There's either hydraulic pistons or springs in the pit of every elevator system. And that is designed to arrest the travel of the elevator at full rated speed, at full load. And so it's, it is, generally, it's really hard to get hurt in an elevator. The elevator, when it is running on automatic mode, will do its job very well. It'll dispatch people to where they need to be. It'll address all of the demand throughout the building. And yeah, the, the, the controller logic, these are devices we've had for a long time. The controller logic is very well suited to managing what it has to do day in, day out. Now I say automatic mode because there are special modes of operation. There are other features of the elevator that you may not know about. That comes into play on the security side. Let's talk about a few features even in automatic mode that exist and you may not know. Features that if you're a building or facilities manager, you could talk to your elevator you know, service techs and maybe employ. Features like load bypass. How many people have been in a crowded elevator? Usually, let's say it's 5 o'clock, everyone's trying to leave a building. You want to go down to the lobby level so everyone can get home. And the elevator starts collecting various hall calls as it's traveling down. Well, let's say you've got about two-thirds of the way down the building, and now this elevator's pretty full. But, of course, there's more down demand. Other people on lower floors are still trying to go down. And you've been in that elevator, right, in a hotel or a business you know, office building where it just keeps platforming at every floor. The door is open, and everyone has to go, oh, sorry, we're full. And the people on the hall stand and wave at you and it slows down the entire process. Elevators have load sensors. Virtually every elevator will have an overload alarm if you put too much weight in it. But this load sensor can be configured as one of the controller inputs for what's called load bypass. If the elevator is just full, the elevator will stop trying to collect more calls and answer that hall demand. It'll just get to, let's say, the lobby and keep people moving through that building. Likewise, you can program elevators for peak operation. If in the morning everyone's trying to get up from the lobby, the elevators can idle at the lobby or even basement level when they're not in use. At the end of the day, the elevators can be programmed to all start bringing themselves up towards the upper floors and idle there, waiting for down demand that is expected. This is all programmable in the controller. There's even more advanced sort of interactive modes where this is sort of like active load management. Anti-nuisance or no passenger are also sometimes known as <laughs> light right. load call right. cancel. Keep going. All right. well, awesome. Here we Die. see an elevator. Watch what happens when we keep hitting buttons. We hit buttons, we hit buttons, buttons, buttons. One, two, three, and boom. This elevator is detecting that too many floor demand buttons are being pressed in the cab very quickly. And it's also detecting that no passengers were going in and out through the beam brake. It's saying, hey, wait a minute. There's, there's not enough passengers to go to all these floors, and it was just canceling all the calls. You can have things. How many people wish they'd been in an elevator that you could cancel a floor once you pressed it? Well, elevators can do that in some instances. They are smart enough. 
Another feature, this is one for people who make it nervous in elevators. Maybe you've experienced a correction run. This is when an elevator maybe stops or slows down while it's traveling, and instead of going to your floor, it feels like it travels way too far, maybe all the way up, all the way down. Maybe it feels like it's even traveling slowly. That's, that could be, you could be experiencing what's called a correction run. If the selector does not feed the controller input that it's expecting, the controller could be monitoring the motor generator and saying, well, the motor has made this many revolutions, so the elevator should have traveled this distance in the hoistway, but that's not what I'm seeing from the selector. Ooh, what, what's wrong here? The elevator might just stop if it really is concerned that it's going to over-travel, or a correction run, it's essentially relearning the hoistway. It will travel usually at slow speed, inspection speed. I think uh, my buddy Howard will tell me I'm wrong, but inspection speed should be about a quarter of normal travel. It'll slowly relearn the hoistway, and when it's established itself, it says, okay, I don't know what that was, but I'm okay again. And then all of a sudden, it'll answer the demand that was happening. Maybe you've been in an elevator when that's happened. Nothing to be worried about. Elevators do their job and have these features for a reason. Let's talk about features that you can trigger, though, to manually give yourself additional control. Let's talk about special modes of operation that you can enable to perhaps change how the elevator would not be, you know, would be behaving in automatic mode. You want to change that. How about attendant service? This harkens back to a time when there used to be an attendant in an elevator handling all of the demand of passengers. You don't see attendants in most elevators anymore, but some still support attendant service. Sometimes there is a key switch or a toggle switch behind a locked key locked panel where you'll have this attendant mode on or off. And in attendant mode, this is sort of like we talked about the, the load bypass, right? If an attendant knows that the elevator is full of a bunch of luggage and says, well, there's no point in going up another nine floors, we're not getting anybody else in this. An attendant can reverse direction of travel. An attendant can hold down this bypass or nonstop button and continue along until you get to the destination without collecting up more hall calls. This is not seen typically in the interaction with uh, you know, the public anymore, but in some buildings you will have what's called express or executive or even VIP service, which is almost like an attendant mode for one user. If you have a big wig at some building, they can be issued a key. They insert their key, they turn it, and the elevator will be prioritized for them. Depending on how it's programmed, it might even voice announce. It might say something like, this elevator is needed for other purposes. Please exit at the next landing. It might reverse direction of travel for some cars that are in the vicinity. But that is something that elevators can do, and in big enough buildings with you know, big shot folk, these are absolutely programmed that way. And if somebody else gets the priority key, well, then that elevator prioritizes their demand, doesn't it? The top priority of any elevator mode, the, the highest, quote, priority service is called medical priority or code blue service. You obviously could expect where you see this. It's in hospitals. This will literally find the nearest elevator at all to where you throw the key in the wall. It will reverse that elevator's direction of travel if necessary and deliver that elevator immediately to the floor where it is being key called. That is, you know, it's a medical alert, it's a medical emergency, they need an elevator right now. You can imagine how that would work. There are other obscure modes, like I happen to love that Japan, some elevators have what's called pet mode. You could ask me about that in the Q&A if you really want. My friend Pinguino said, I would support that if the dogs could run the elevator. That's, that's not how it works, but it is a cute thing. Speaking of Japan and the Pacific, or where I live on the West Coast, there is seismic mode. Elevators can have sensors equipped in them where if the building experiences a certain amount of g-force and shaking, the elevator will behave in a way that says, please exit the elevator. It is not safe to be in this little platform at the nearest floor. Open its doors. Let people out. Instead of, as Howard likes to say, you have seismic unrest, but there's also civil unrest. Now we get into the security features. There's riot mode. Well, what's riot mode? You can manually trigger an elevator and some high priority buildings like art museums and galleries and things like that may have this feature, it will disable the lobby or street level landings. So no passengers can go down to the lobby even if they don't know the unrest in the street is taking place and none of the lobby demand calls are going to bring an elevator to that floor. If the lobby level or the ground level of a building is security compromised, you can still use an elevator in riot mode as it is, as it is known uh, around the rest of the building for regular interbuilding travel. Interbuilding travel is not interrupted. 
Now, you don't see riot mode often. As I said, I've only heard of it uh, from Howard in, in some real expensive uh, places like museums. I have heard of a security service in the medical world at hospitals called Code Pink. Code Pink is triggered when somebody tries to move an ex a high-value object out of a building and the elevator is part of the lockdown procedure. Anybody who's had a child in recent years finds out that it's not just the little paper tag anymore on a, on, a, on a baby in the nursery, right? They have the little baby lojack in the hospitals now. If you try to move a baby in an unauthorized fashion, various alerts in a hospital will happen. Doors will lock and security will be dispatched. Elevators can be wired to be part of this. Elevators can trip automatically or manually, depending on the nature of your install, into what is called a security recall posture. This will, again, it will take control away from the user in the cab. This will prevent the elevator from being driven to certain places. It can even behave like a man trap. The elevator can stop maybe on a certain predetermined floor and sit there with its doors shut. Or it will forcibly cycle the doors if the guards are at the ready so the door, no one can hide in the elevator. There's a lot of interesting security repurposing that the industry has thought a lot about. There's also interesting security repurposing that just feels very bolted on after the fact, though. You may see key switches in certain elevators that just say things like security, on, off. What are these? It depends on the install. A lot of times, this is just an aftermarket need where someone says, well, we need the uh, housekeeping staff and the service staff to be able to get to, let's say, the basement. But we don't want hotel guests going to the basement. It's not for public you know, use down there let's turn on and off the basement access, or let's turn on and off this particular floor. <coughs> security lockouts, and we'll see much more about security lockouts in the upcoming section, can do a number of things to try to restrict regular everyday user movement around a building. How well do they work? Well, they can be undermined. They can be undermined with other special modes of operation. Now here's where it gets fun for pen testers. Okay, independent service. We use this more often pretty much than any other special mode in an elevator when we are conducting a physical penetration of a building and we need to move around in an unauthorized way. Independent service is like having local admin rights on one elevator. You've seen a key switch. This, this is a uh, flipping toggle switch. Either way, independent service will take one cab out of the bank of elevators if they are in a group dispatch mode. It'll take it out. And it'll ignore all the hall demand. It'll ignore all the other demand in the building and give you local control over that cab from within the car. Now, depending on how independent is configured, this can often even mean like control of the doors. I can use open door open, door close to dictate when and where the doors open. I can drive to different floors. Many times this will override individualized security lockouts that a building may have specified. They might say, none of these elevators can go to the 10th floor. But again, if I'm taking the elevator out of the bank of operation and giving it individual control to me, I can often bypass many of those restrictions. I have used this to hide in a building for hours on end. I've just, one time I wheeled an office chair in when I had social engineered my way in a building during the working hours. I just sat in the elevator for a few hours, plugged my phone in, there was a little outlet in this panel, and I just read Twitter until it was 6 o'clock. And the, the fellows outside, they said, oh, it looks like everyone's gone home. Deviant, come down and let us in. Independent service, super useful. Now, of course, not every elevator has independent service. You know what almost every elevator everywhere, especially in this country, does have, though? Some form of fire service. This is the big one. This is also one that you heard my warnings at first. Don't mess around with this if you don't know what you're doing. But fire service mode, fire service operation is by code going to override almost all security lockouts and movement restrictions you can think of. Because in an emergency, the elevator has to do certain things. If there is a fire in the building, or if you manually trigger what is called fire service phase one, that's, this, that's what an elevator would be running on if it detects a smoke or heat condition. Phase one will almost always forcibly make the elevator drive itself to the main landing, usually the lobby landing, unless that's where the fire is, in which case it'll go to the alternate landing. But it'll make the elevator platform. It'll almost always, always, always make the elevator open its doors. So we've seen clients where they say, you can't even call our elevators. That Without a badge, the elevator won't do anything for you. If the elevator's on fire service, that phase one mode, the elevator's showing up, and it's opening its doors, you betcha. 
There's also fire service phase two, if you're inside of the elevator cab. Here we see on the left side of the screen, sort of down in the lobby, you would see that phase one switch. The right side of the screen, this is a phase two switch. This is on the car operating panel in the elevator cab. And if you turn that into phase two, you are then treated as a first responder. The elevator thinks you are a fire <laughs> fireman and that you are allowed to do whatever you need. Because let's be honest, even if a company CEO, she says, look, there's so much high tech you know, research we do in this building, I want access restrictions on floors eight, nine, and 10. Yeah, good for you, you can have that most of the time. But if, if a first responder is in the building and they're running the elevator on phase two, by code, all those access restrictions should go out the window. So fire service is something that we have leveraged with proper training and supervision on penetration jobs. If you have the keys, if you can interact with those key switches, absolutely you can override almost every restrictions you could think of. So what are some other restrictions? What are, we touched on quote security service, but what are specific elevator restrictions? Well, how some simple attempts are made, you can just disable the hall call buttons. As I say, preventing people from being able to call the elevator with a call button lockout. Here's a little key switch next to the hall buttons. Here's one on the same panel as the hall buttons. There's elevators with no hall call buttons where you can only call the elevator by means of a key. Or maybe you've seen this in a hotel. This looks like a standard hall call button. You can see the phase one fire switch below it. But that's not a hall call button. I can't push it. It's just the light. The only way to latch a call in this elevator was to use my room key. And that, you know, the elevator said, okay, here you are, I'm gonna, here's an up call, I'm gonna service that demand, and it opened its door. If you look around facilities, you might see odd keypads or card readers attached to many hall call stations. So here we see there's clearly a hall demand button, and that button is probably disabled by the key switch below. So someone could come up, either use the key switch, which by the way, this looks like a Dover Impulse system, so we all know what that key switch is. Why do I know that? Well, we're going to get into that in the, in the key section in a minute. Or if they didn't have keys on them or they don't want to issue a, a mechanical key, a physical key to everybody who needs the elevator, they might issue people PIN codes. And I'm sure this is an aftermarket product that the PIN code would latch some hall demand call. Maybe you've seen this in the cab of an elevator. Maybe you can call the elevator, but individual floors are locked out where there's a cutout switch for each particular floor, and that floor can be enabled or disabled. Maybe you've seen elevator systems where it's not a mechanical switch, it's a card reader, but it's in the cab. So you, if you want to get to certain floors, you have to you know, use your room key in some hotels. That's very common. Or maybe in a corporate environment, you have to badge in with your prox badge before the elevator will go to certain floors. All of these are very typical ways of trying to control movement in a building with an elevator. Do any of them work? No, not, not particularly well. We'll talk about why. The only really neat way of physically locking people off from an elevator, Howard showed me this photo. This is not you know, a picture of just the hall button. It's the giant, the giant lock next to the hall button. It doesn't control use of that hall switch. It controls this giant cage that is around the elevator. This was in a corrections environment. And you know, this is a funny picture, of course, but this really is representative of kind of the only way you can secure traffic in a building if there's elevators. Think of your elevators like a giant open stairwell. If I can get in that elevator, the, the chance is very high that I can make that elevator go to any floor of my choosing. And unless you are locking off the elevator, you don't need to use a cage like this. But think of, just like an open stairwell, think of a vestibule. If at each landing, the elevator doesn't dump you right out into a, a big open office plan, but if you have a little elevator landing vestibule lobby that is locked off with doors on either side of it, that is proper elevator security because the elevator itself should not be treated as secure. Why is this? Well, let's walk through some of those security properties that we talked about and knock them all down. Remember when there's no hall call buttons? Like, oh my gosh, no one could ever get in the elevator. Yeah, well, there's a few things about that. Here's elevator doors popping open. What happened there? I don't know. Let's watch it again really quickly. There's, can't get here, but stick something in. I realize the video is a little shaky, and on the webcast it's a little choppy, but did you see what was happening there? Did you see what they stuck through the door? Someone just stuck a piece of paper through the beam, and they broke the, the beam break on the, uh, on the door sensor. The door thought something was in it, and the doors just sprung open. 
Now, I am not advising you to stick something through a door like the hoistway doors when you don't know what's on the other side. This is not a smart thing to do, but you cer certainly shouldn't rely on the fact that the elevator will magically just stay closed at all times without a key or a badge. Speaking of key cards in the elevator, right? Maybe you're in a hotel, maybe you're in a system where you've got to use your RFID badge or else you can't get to certain floors. Well, let's look at this. We can't get to the top penthouse floor of this hotel. There's a card reader. But here's a little locked panel. What's this? Click that switch and you'll see a photo of it in a minute. Just says card reader on off. Let's close that up. That literally just allows or disallows the elevator controller to care at all about the card reader input. So here we have on this locked panel down on these Otis fixtures, and of course I had the default key. This is also default key you're about to learn. Look inside the locked panel, in addition to an independent service switch, which probably could have gotten me up there, but that you know causes a little more disturbance in the building. Uh, it's it's going to stop servicing demand. Sometimes independent service somebody might say, oh, what's, what's up with this elevator? The, the position indicator in the lobby suddenly said something weird. And then, so independent service, I would have to stay on independent for the full travel run to get up to that top floor. You saw with the card reader switch, I could just switch it off, latch that demand, I could latch a call, the 33, and then just turn the card reader back on. That call is already registered with the controller and it's going to travel up there without my need. Independent, always there for me as well. Sometimes these are not toggle switches, sometimes they are just keyed switches, but either way, these electronic switches are telling the controller to ignore or disregard certain inputs. In this case, the input of the card reader. Just forget about cards for a while. So you may notice that triggering these special modes of operation, whether it's independent or fire service or playing with a card reader or any number of other things, you're either talking about manual toggle switches, which are behind a hidden panel, sometimes a lock panel typically, or if you can see them right on the, on the cab somewhere, you're talking about key switches. Now here's the thing that gets interesting and a lot of people might be blown away by this. There are a lot of elevator keys out there. This is Howard's key collection. It's, you know, he's, he's helped me out building my own up, but boy, his, nobody can really rival his. The thing about elevator fixtures is that every one of these keys has a very specific purpose and is very often tied to specific branding. Various fixtures, either the factory default fixtures or third-party aftermarket fixtures that are used in modernization and retrofits, these are all going to have some default keying, typically. And it is very uncommon for anyone to ever change that keying. The elevator equipment shows up, it gets installed, it gets up and running, and you might have a default key. For example, you might have an Otis elevator. You're going to see well, a lot of keys that you saw in that first picture are four keys in a row, UTC, UTA. This is older Otis systems, but again, there's the standard Otis keys. <laughs> Montgomery Kone, another huge name in elevators in this country. Many people think all elevators might look alike, but if, you're, if you start noticing, well, this is clearly a Schindler, so I know which keys to reach for, or ThyssenKrupp, they also own Dover. ThyssenKrupp is uh, you know the, the Dover system, the Tyson and Dover, very common in a lot of a lot of hotels that we run into. Maybe the DerbyCon hotel might happen to have Tyson Krupp fixtures. Dover Impulse, I said earlier, those big round rounded cornered square, slightly concave buttons. You see these in lower buildings many times, like small hotels, four or five story hotels. Dover Impulse, they have that market solidly locked down. All have the same key. Aftermarket vendors, EPCO, huge player in the elevator industry for different panels, uh, you know, vandal resistant panels, et cetera. Innovation industries. Again, these all, like here, we have some tubular keys on the EPCO and on the innovation. These are going to be default keyed. <coughs> and by learning what elevators look like, by learning the fixtures very quickly, Howard, my associate, he can stand in an elevator cab in a second or I can even send him a message on my phone and be like, hey man, I'm on a job. What, what is this elevator? And he's like, what are you in Japan? That's a Fujitech elevator. What are you doing there? He can just identify instantly and tell me, oh yeah, the default key, try this one. Now it's really interesting, the fact that the industry uses default keying, but many times you'll see notes scribbled in the elevators, especially on behind panels where there are key switches because the elevator service staff might not even realize it's a default key. 
<coughs> clearly innovation fixtures here, but somebody doesn't just know that offhand, and they wrote themselves notes. They said, oh, I've got to use the EX513 key for this, or the EX512 key for the run stop. That's all of these elevators. Remember, they have default keying. And I'm going to bet that every elevator you've ever been in, including ones that have some sort of security lockouts, they've been default keyed. If you've ever seen, as Howard will call it, elevator graffiti inside of panels, that's what it's about. It's usually notes regarding the key configuration of that system. And again, this one's default, almost default keyed. Clearly a Montgomery Kone elevator. It's Kone 1, Kone 4, but the fire service switch, the phase 1 and phase 2 switches, are not Kone keying. Somebody changed them out, ran a, you know, a refit. So do all elevators have all of these controls? No. Some elevators have less of them. Some elevators will not have, let's say, independent, or they will not have a card reader control. Almost all elevators are going to have fire service. But you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've been in really new looking systems, buildings where you, you register your demand in the lobby at a, like a computer station, and it tells you, go to elevator A, or go to elevator B or C. These are, and, and in the elevator, there's just no controls, right? There's no controls at all in the cab. That's called a destination dispatch system. A lot of people don't like them. They are very good at making efficient movement of people through a building, but the, the illusion of control is not there when you're in the cab and you have nothing to sort of tell it where to go. So they are not as popular, but they are really efficient for moving around the building. But you look at this panel, right, and you say, well, how could I leverage this from a security posture? Like, literally, there's no controls in here. Well, remember, by code, there should always be fire service. And what do your fire keys let you do in a destination dispatch elevator? Anytime you're in an elevator that seems to have no controls, look for a key lock and a really big panel door. You know what that's holding? Right there. There's all of your floor demand, all of your, it's, it's like having access to a regular car operating panel. And of course, on various special modes of operation, you can, you can leverage that like you would a conventional elevator. So keep that in mind. And uh, newer systems, newer doesn't necessarily mean better or more secure. But let's forget about the future for a minute here, okay? The, the industry, the elevator industry is one that is still really stuck in the past as far as technology of security is concerned. These are all screenshots of various management interfaces. You can see that none of them really are going to be running in a modern Windows environment. Here you see a lot of XP, obviously. One's running in a DOS box. This is a little video clip from a motor room where you can see a couple of PCs are up there, and these PCs are talking over probably serial, I'm going to say. Howard will correct me if I'm wrong. But these PCs are talking to the elevator controller for configuration and management. These PCs are not driving the elevator, I should point out. The elevator is doing its own thing. But you can see the management controls. This is, here's all of your settings. You can monitor what's going on. You can change certain parameters. And it was running on, what was the OS? Did this video show it while I was booting? Yeah, it's running XP. Let's hope that's not sitting on you know, the, the building's intranetwork. Intra it's not hopefully, hopefully not on the LAN, but I'm sure it might be at some point. Do you want controls like the drive and safety operation and so forth accessible via somebody who can pop an XP box? I wouldn't. This is you know, screenshots from a user manual for controlling remote management configuration. You know. LiftNet. LiftNet is a way of talking through your building automation control and uh, letting the elevators respond to certain events around the building. <clears throat> Default standard access, user ID 123, password 456. Yeah, that's excellent. That's super secure, right? But don't worry, there is an admin password that lets you change it. The admin access is A, B, C, D, E, F. There you go. Uh, MCE, just you know, another elevator uh, management tool, MCE software. This is in their actual manual that they ship to customers, and they say, if you have an edge router, you know, like a Linksys router, which they assume everyone has, because corporate environment, right, you're going to be running Linksys. Like, so they say, create a new user account on your router. Call it MCE support and use the password of MCE support. While you're at it, go ahead and change your router's password just to MCE support. Just make everything MCE support for the admin access, because that, that'll always make sure MCE can get in remotely and do their thing. So be aware that the industry is not, it's not really crafted with security in mind. It's, it's crafted with safety in mind. Security is secondary to the safe operation of an elevator. And that's why, as pen testers, we typically can get anywhere we need with the keys. So someone in the q and I'm even noticing they're saying, not to mention most of these locks are simple locks to pick. Many of them can be. Many of them are wafer locks or very basic tubular locks. 
we don't recommend trying to pick them on jobs because if you accidentally pick a lock in the, in the wrong position and get stuck, or if it's a tubular pick job and you pick it in between positions, I'm not saying that's never happened on a job. I'm not going to say it was my company or an associate who did it, but it happens. But for the most part, because these are default keyed, we can just use the keys. If we have the keys in our bags, which we always do, we can do things like, for example, this. This is, this is a hypothetical building. This was a, a job that we had. And I want you to picture the building like this. There was a security desk out front. The security desk is where everyone came in. They badged in. They interacted with the guard. And we wanted to see if we didn't you know, do any social engineering. Could we get in? Because their whole thing was we've been training our guards for months. They, they really they look, they check for tailgating. They really are making sure people can't try to bluff their way in. We said, okay. Let's not interact with the guard. We probably could have gotten past the guard, but we'll take your word for it. Let's try to go another way. Here's what we did. You will see in a video that we came in the back. There was a parking deck uh, up on the back of the building that they didn't think anyone could get to. Why? Well, you needed a badge to get the big lift arm, the gate, to go up on the parking deck. We walked up the ramp. They didn't think of that. The back door on the building was locked, but you'll see it was not locked you know, very well. But then it came to the elevator. This back entrance only had a stairwell that went to nowhere, because we didn't have a, a key for the stairwell door, or an elevator. And this elevator was supposedly not able to go up and down without proper credentials. So what did we do? Well, let's show you. They literally didn't believe this happened, so we pulled security footage. Here's the door. It's locked. But, you know, like I said, it wasn't locked very well. Now, Howard and I are at the elevator. We can call the elevator, but let's see what happens here. We can't tell it to go up yet. Now, very quickly, a lot of things just happened, but what we did is, without causing a lot of hubbub, we were able to trip the elevator and send it into, see that jewel is lit, the fire service jewel? We are running in fire service right now. We can drive this elevator anywhere we want in the building. We can pop out on the next floor. And the culture of this office was such that once we were in, we were in. Like, nobody suspected a thing because, oh, you must have come through that lobby. You must have talked to the guard. You must be authorized. All with these, you know, simple little fire keys, right? And when we showed this to the client, the, you know, one of the managers went nuts. They went ballistic. And they said, oh, my gosh, we were lied to by our elevator technicians. We were told that elevator doesn't go up. And I was like, listen to what you're saying, brother. Like... <laughs> Elevators have one job, which is to go up. Of course, they, in their head, they, they pictured elevators can't go up without a badge. But if you're running in fire service, absolutely. Let's talk about those fire service keys for a second, a couple of interesting case studies. Many states have a single key for their whole state. Sometimes this is a key that every elevator is required to use on the key switch. But more often than not, what states have, because that's very expensive, obviously, to retrofit every elevator. That's, that's hard to do. But many states have started adopting key boxes where there will be a specific place in every building, usually a little red box, and that box will be equipped with the statewide key. That box will then contain the fire service default keys for whatever elevators are in use at that facility. Now, these key boxes, you usually are not supposed to be able to have the keys for them, obviously. Like, they don't just sell these you know, easily, unrestricted fashion. They'll sell you the box, though. So if you let's say, oh, I'm John the Constructor, and I have a new building going up. I need to call up my vendor, and, you know, I'm going to call up uh, Vader Accessories, or who knows, I'm going to buy a box. So they'll send you the box, but they won't send you the key. Now, have you ever done any lock picking? You can absolutely pick this lock. Let's go ahead and pick it. Not only can you pick the lock, but then you can measure the, the lock once you've picked it open, especially a tubular lock. Maybe use a little tubular key cutter that you have right in your tool bag and make a working key. And we have, in fact, done that. So here you have the key box is working with this handmade key. We have the entire elevator key for Indiana at this time. We actually did this in many states. We did this in states, for example, that don't use a tubular key but use a Medico key. If you're familiar with Medico locks, they are a, a nice design. Not completely unpickable, but I wouldn't want to stand there trying to pick it. Again, though, they'll ship you the box. They will ship you the lock, not the key. What can you do if the box is open? Because it comes open. You have to be able to mount it to the wall. If you can get to the back side and disassemble the lock, 
pull it apart. If you know anything about high security locksmithing, you can take out the pins, measure them, reassemble it, put it back on the wall, and then there you go. We have the Kentucky key box. We have the Virginia key box. We have the Louisiana key box. We've done this a lot of places. And we have the bidding for those keys. But the real big one, the real big security risk as far as universal fire keying is, and Howard, will ha he has hammered this at industry conferences, the FEO K1. What is the FEO K1? Okay. This was designed to be a universal standard fire key. It was literally rolled out as part of the idea of updating code. So, you know, they said, look, this should be the new standard key. None of this Indiana box and California box. There should just be one key. And that's very often seen either in the elevator fixtures itself or on these key boxes. Let's take a look at what the FBO K1 key did in one building that we were checking out. So here is a building. Now you can call the elevator. Penetration testers make it look like they're just getting in the cab, but instead somebody reaches up with their FEO K1, pulls a few things out of this little red elevator box. Well, what's in there? Well, there's a key to this room, the elevator service room, the equipment room, but it's a small enough office building that they were using that for everything. They were using that as their security office. You can see the camera system there. You can see their network rack is in there. Here's the machine room itself. In there, there's another lockbox on the wall. If we go ahead and use a tubular pick to pop this lockbox open, you'll see we discover something else that you should never have access to in an elevator system. If you're a member of the general public, you should never have what's called a drop key. That's very bad if people get their hands on that. But let's, let's recap. What did the FEO K1 give us? Well, it gave us the local fire service key for that building so that the elevators, we could use them on fire service mode if we wanted to get around and pass restrictions. The alarm panel was locked up. That key was in the little red key box. The sprinkler valve locks. Uh, this state the building was in, uh, a state that requires all valves to be controlled and locked in the open position so that nobody can accidentally turn off the water. You know, you could have someone get the key and turn off the water. That would be pretty bad. Obviously, it gave us access to the machine room door, which was actually also sort of the sock of that building. So basically, in this building, the FEO key one gave us everything. It gave us full access to the entire building. And this is, again, it's by code. When ASME put out this original FEO K1 designation, they said, you know, this is a very powerful key. It should work everywhere. And of course, it should be limited to elevator personnel and emergency responders. You, should, you don't just want this floating around, right? Well, I told you, this is not an industry that comes from a security background. They published the direct bidding code of the FEO K1 in the code document. Like, this is online. This is online, it's a PDF you can just download. Like, that's on the internet right now. And someone said, yeah, that seems legit. That's a good idea. Let's go ahead and do that. Now, they have revised this code document, actually. Um, oh, you thought they revised it and took out the bidding. No, the bidding is still in there. But now there's also a beautiful dimensional drawing that shows you exactly which positions the code is in. Because some people were making the keys. They were cutting them clockwise and not counterclockwise. So they said, no, 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 you guys, let me make sure you really understand how the FEOK1 key looks. And what did this lead to? It led to exactly what you think. The FEOK1 is all over the internet now. Uh, it's a key you can buy for basically no money on eBay, on other websites. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly scary that cert certain places, like I think Howard will correct me if I'm wrong, but the state of Vermont retroactively required all elevators to be FEOK1. So every elevator in Vermont was modernized up and had their key switch changed for fire service. Plenty of other local, local jurisdictions use FEO K1. It is, it is the top fire service key. And remember what I said earlier, if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't be messing with these special modes, especially fire service mode. So are there even more powerful modes, by the way? There are. You think, how, how could that be? Who could be more important than, than first responder crews? Well, elevator techs, of course. I mean, it's not just because elevator folk think that they're the most special people in the elevator world. It's that if you're working in the hoistway, if you're using what's called hoistway access to do service and maintenance, you need to be in control of that car. You need it to do exactly what you want it to do. You should not mess around in an elevator shaft if you don't know what you're doing in an elevator shaft. I think that goes without saying. You should not be putting elevators onto hoistway inspection or sometimes called hoistway access service. 
But if you're in the hoist way, that is it. That is the ball game for control. You can run the elevator using controls that are in the that are that are outside of the regular cab and get anywhere at all. Talk about bypassing your lockouts. This was a medical facility, and this is late at night. We are on a lower floor, and again, you can see we pulled the security camera footage, right? We're on a lower floor, and we want to go to an upper floor. This is completely not how you're supposed to do this. You are, we are seizing the elevator car top in a very non-standard way. But with these hoistway doors open, let's flip on a work light. There's the elevator car top. We're all going to stand on top of the car, and using these car top run controls, you're going to witness a ride take place in the hoistway. All right. So we're going to let these hoistway doors close very gently. And as soon as those doors close, the elevator motor is live again. This, the safety circuit is enabled. And we can now drive this anywhere we want. We can drive it down. We can drive it up. We're proving that we can travel anywhere in the building. And ultimately, you're going to see where we go. Let's just go ahead up to the next floor, the restricted floor, where there was, I think there was all kind of medical drug storage on this next floor. Those hoistway doors are not locked on the inside. If you can get inside the hoistway, you can open them up very easily. And there we are. And you can just send it down. So we were upstairs, we were able to get through the building, and there's no audit log of that happening. There was no record of that happening. This is, uh, it's, it's very, very freaky when you show people that this is possible. And again, they just, we had to pull security footage. They didn't think this was possible. There's one other mode I want to tell you about. The super god mode, that is being in the machine room. Being right at the elevator controller, you can actually, you can essentially manipulate the environment of the elevator. You can change variables. You can change inputs. You can change what information the controller thinks is actually happening in real world. So not only are you seeing a display panel here on an elevator controller, but you can just do something like jumpering. I said earlier if an elevator hits its like final limit, the elevator will shut down and will refuse to move. Well, what happens? How do you fix that? An elevator technician comes out and will actually put jumpers on these circuit blocks, and they will jump out various contexts. They'll change the elevator's perception of what's happening, and they'll be able to run the motor out of spec to you know, get that elevator back into its normal course of travel. This is done with regularity during testing. I told you that the pit buffer in an elevator shaft is able to withstand a strike from the elevator at travel. This is an elevator coming at full run speed all the way down the shaft and hitting the pit buffer. This is not an accident that you're about to see. This is planned. This is a test. Now that sounds really bad, and this camera's on a tripod. No one's down in the pit watching this, and no one is in the elevator when this happens. But this is a five-year test. The elevator technicians will jump around all the safeties and force the elevator to crash into the pit buffer. And it's supposed to be just fine. And in this case, it was just fine. Now, if you're in the elevator when that happens, you might get a little shaken up. That's why you don't want anyone in the machine room remaking the environment that the elevator is running. A quick one for all the old-time phone freaks. Elevator phones. There are emergency phones in most elevators. They should all be there by, by code. Some of them are violating code. The e-phone not working is a common problem in crappy elevators. But that means there is a live phone line in almost every elevator. Now, you can get to it from the machine room. You can sometimes even get to it right there on the panel. And, you know, depending on what you're trying to leverage on a pen test, having a little pocket telephone with you, which our friend Dennis always recommends, this little hands-free corded telephone microphone kit you can find on Amazon. Being able to tap into a phone line, place phone calls, maybe even hit the local PBX, it's not a bad idea, especially if you're, like I was, on independent service, sitting in an elevator for two hours waiting for a building to empty out. I could have done some interesting things with the phone line. The real scary thing about phones and elevators, though, is not making calls, but just listening in. Elevators are spaces where a lot of people treat them as private. They will have very sensitive conversations. Elevators have e-phones or intercoms, depending on the setup. And the nefarious thing, really, is, is just calling up an elevator and not talking, just listening. Here we're going to see a little video. I hope it's not too choppy. 
This elevator system has an intercom right in the lobby. Now I'm going to get in this elevator and I'm just going to talk. What happens if people are in the elevator and you press this and you don't say a word? So I'm in the elevator and let's see if you can hear me. Now, I didn't hear that that elevator intercom was picking up. In the cab, all I heard was silence. I was just a person talking. Now, as I say, many times those intercoms are rigged up in the motor room, but uh, if, if they're in the motor room, no one might not even be aware that the intercom exists in the elevator. And the e-phone, if you call the elevator phone from an outside line, they're usually designed to pick up silently and just sit there off hook. So don't think of an elevator as quite the private space you might think. A few notes for facilities people, just to give you some guidance. I know we've been talking for a little while here. We want to save time for questions, but some common problems, entrapments, things like the, uh, the stop switch being used for like assaults and robberies, this does happen. Change it to a key switch if you can. Not securing your hoistways. Like I've done a lot of exploring around buildings on pen tests and otherwise. I shouldn't be able to find hoistways and look into the hoistways. Not securing the motor room. We talked about how important the motor room is as a safe space. This is not a proper secure job. This is not a proper person to be working in the motor room. This is a security guard being sent to look around at an elevator that, quote, had a problem. That person doesn't belong in there. There's stuff in motor rooms that will very much hurt you if you don't know what you're doing. Know who your contractor is and rely on him or her for the job they should be doing. And also, this applies to, you know, when we pen test a building, follow your procedures. You should be badging people in. You should be checking people in at the front desk. If someone just says, oh, I'm here to fix the elevator, oh, I'm doing your semi-annual inspection, we breezed our way into so many buildings looking like the elevator techs, Howard and I, because they're not checking. They, oh, well, you're doing some of the elevator, or right, whatever. Follow, who, follow your procedures if people are coming in. And ultimately, if, if your security guard is an elevator, you really don't have a security guard. And the, like we say, what's, what's the worst that could possibly happen? Well, here is a three-factor authenticator. This is a contact card, a PIN code, and a biometric reader. It is in an elevator, and it's supposed to be controlling travel of this elevator between floors. Why? Well, because this is an airport. This elevator travels between the sterile zone, the passenger zone, and the exterior areas, the service corridors of the airport, the ground level, the parking. You'll notice, however, that the fire jewel is lit. This elevator is running on fire service. This elevator can travel between those zones without using the authenticator reader. And when you say, what's the worst that could happen? Well, if it's just a simulation, maybe someone is testing. We have, we've, we've known of many jobs where people have brought weapons into an airport, not necessarily leveraging the elevator, but if, you, you know, if you're running a test, oh, well, can we get a weapon past TSA? Imagine just using the elevator. Or what if it's not a test? What if someone went on eBay, bought the $7 key, and then could travel right from the parking garage up to the passenger deck? Start looking around, especially in buildings you think are secure, in areas you think are secure. Start looking around in your airports. You're going to see key boxes. You're going to see key readers. Here's, here's another elevator, of course. Clearly, we have passenger level. We have restricted level. We have a pin code that's supposed to be locking out this elevator from travel between those levels. However, what do we have here behind this panel? We have key switches, including an independent service key switch. Interestingly enough, you can see uh, the lock on this panel wasn't even there. The lock was just gone. But clearly, you know, Adam's elevator fixtures on these key switches, if someone has the MM101, they could flip to independent or above it you can see fire. Maybe someone's getting somewhere they shouldn't be expected to get in this elevator, which was also in an airport. So keep in mind, there are just elevator technicians, the people who are installing, configuring, and doing your parts, oil, and grease. And then there are elevator techs who are from the security community. There's not too many of them. Howard is pretty much the best one out there, i got to say. Keep this in mind. Keep, keep all of the physical side in mind. That's what we love talking about during these webcasts with SANS. Keep physical attacks in mind because... If you're relying on systems that you think are just so futuristic that no one could possibly get in, like if you're using your RFID badges around your facility, this is stuff Core Group does all the time. Here is a badge clone that you're about to see, and up to the reader, 
Click. Bam. Bobak walks his way into the wiring closet. How did he do that, by the way? How did we clone the badge? Well, Bobak, our lead researcher and the co-founder of the core group, he weaponizes long-range readers. He takes this long-range, high-gain antenna, packs it with his own electronics, and then this big reader pad can be slipped in a laptop bag. Here we see our friend Dennis. He's going to sit down next to somebody on a public bench. <clears throat> he looks like he's messing with his phone. What's that? Oh, you're here? Oh, you just pulled up? Oh, okay, I'll come meet you. And Dennis leaves. What you didn't see is that Dennis just did a badge grab right there. He grabbed the RFID credential out of this other man's pocket. Or maybe you can go right up to the reader on the wall and you might install a sniffer right on the wires. Again, this is not Hollywood hocus pocus. This is real. Installing sniffers, using card cloners, this is what the core group does. This is what we specialize in training. If you come into a SANS classroom, you take one of our physical security and physical penetration courses, you will go hands-on with all of this. You will get your own Proxmark. You will get your own ESP key, sniff traffic later. You will learn how to do it all. And we love popping open some eyes and waking people up to this. If you want to do this, if you want to learn about this, uh, you can check the SANS websites. We'll be at SANS Austin coming up very soon. There's a few spots left in that class. I think the Orlando class is almost full, but you can check us out there. We're always at Network Security in Vegas. If you want to become a physical penetration person, you can absolutely do it, and we're happy to help. A couple more tips. I'm going to wrap it up with a couple tips for you, and then we'll do questions, and I'm enjoying myself. I hope you are too. Uh, if you are someone you know is stuck in an elevator, do the following. First of all, don't panic. Remember, you're not going to run out of air. There's nothing unsafe. You're not going to die. If the main lights are off, you probably don't have a lot of options. If the, e if the emergency light's the only thing that's on in there, it's probably the, the power is completely out. If the main lights are on, though, try a few things. Press door open. I mean, it sounds silly, but sometimes the elevator just doesn't want to run or move or something went wrong. The elevator doesn't want to go anywhere, but door open will still op work the door operator. Press door open. If that didn't work, press door close and then press door open. That'll sometimes reset the door operator. Try placing calls to other floors, not just the floor you wanted. Try placing calls to the lobby especially. If there's some security lockout that's not working correctly, the lobby is usually not part of it, try to, try to get a call to the lobby. If there are badge readers of any kind or key card readers, try them again. Try them a few times and be really quick with your place your floor calls again. If you're authorized, you know, try those key switches. Get that elevator on independent mode, that might get it moving. And lastly, unless you heard something really loudly fail, like if you were traveling in the hoistway and boom, you hear a clang and the elevator stops, I wouldn't touch anything. But if you didn't hear anything fail, if the elevator just stopped for some reason, verify that the doors are closed. Don't stick your hand into the door jam, but just with the flat of your palm on the doors, make sure the elevator door isn't wobbling or swinging. If it rattled or bounced open slightly, you could have hit a safety stop. The elevator would say, oh, why is the door open? It would have stopped. Make sure the door is closed. And if nothing else works at all, try, try to call for help. Use the e-phone, your mobile phone if it works, or just hold down that alarm bell. Hopefully someone will hear it. What do you never do? Never leave through the top hatch. It is dangerous. Uh, it will foul other things up. And once you get up there, where are you? You're stuck in a hoistway. There's, there's nothing for you to do. There's no ladder in the hoistway. <coughs> also, do not ever exit a badly misleveled car. If you have to jump, uh, that the rule of thumb, that is too far. Here you see like a janitor helping people out of a, an elevator with like a bench or something here. I, I would tell that person to buzz off. I would wait until trained professionals showed up. If you're stuck, the safest place to be is in the elevator itself. So keep that in mind. Keep physical security in mind. And thank you so much for listening here. I'm going to go down the questions. I'm going to enjoy hearing your thoughts on all of this. And yeah, this was, this was really fabulous. So as you are kind of used to with the SANS webcast experience now, I like, I like giving you the personal touch with my questions here. So hopefully we can see this window. I hope the window is not blocking the screen. I can try to read it up here. So yes, hello, Dying, dying is bad, ouch, says Greg, yes. Remember, what was the first thing we said? Dying is bad. We don't want you messing around with elevators if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, we are to various degrees, trained professionals. Howard is, is truthfully the trained professional on our team. The rest of us, you know, look at, look, at this, look at this crew of jokers. Would you trust us around your building? I hope so, because we're really good at what we do. But in general, 
keep that in mind. So, needed something to quit. But I was in California, Greg says, and a smart-looking young man was chatting up a very lovely girl. Then he leaned against the buttons. Most of the floors were then selected. It was very funny. It was funny as long as you weren't trying to get somewhere very quickly. Uh, yeah, that, that's what we talked about, the multiple call presses, multiple button presses. It's nice when a controller will detect that as an error condition and just blank them out. Derek asks, what recourse do we have to secure elevators that have these fire keys required by code? Magnificent question. Very little is the answer. Uh, anybody who has talked to legal over code compliance knows there's not a lot of wiggle room most of the time for any sort of code compliance issues. If you saw my last webcast, I showed uh, you, you know, leveraging ADA compliance and getting through doors by bypassing with the handles. The one thing that I'll tell you, you know, if you literally are like a colo facility or something, you could be a low occupancy structure. I'm not a lawyer. Talk to your lawyers. If you're a low occupancy structure, sometimes you can get variances against code. But having the elevators operate a certain way during a fight, this is not like a room. The elevator is a very specific, very regulated space that needs to do certain things if a fire breaks out. I don't know of variances offhand that you could get. The best thing you do is don't treat the elevator like it's secure. Just vestibule off the elevator landings on, on secure floors. Fantastic and scary presentation, says Bruce. Well, thank you, Bruce. I hope it was like good scary, not, not bad scary, but that's just me. I'll take it. I don't mind being a little scary. Daniel asks, what was that mini analog phone that you showed? Oh, yeah. So we have to thank Dennis Maldonado. Uh, Dennis works for friends of ours at the Lares company now, and uh, he's a really smart cat. Dennis showed me that one of the first times I ever met him, and he has leveraged it on a lot of jobs. Uh, he you know, even made his own little alligator clip wires like I have done now. It is, if you look on Amazon for mini corded handset, you will sometimes find them. They are almost always shipping from Hong Kong for like weeks of delay, but you know, you're getting them for like 12 bucks. And it's, it literally is as small as you think. It's very tiny, and it just has a little headset jack and a little RJ11 jack. So if you look for, I, I can even try to throw up a link later. I buy them when I, they, they're always sold by vendors that are like around for a week and then that vendor goes away and then a, a month later some other vendor will be selling the same thing in a different color. From Tom from Tool says hello. Oh, right on, man. Tool, are you still, now are you still in Portland or did you move from Portland? It's funny, I grew up in Philadelphia where if you're from the New England area and someone says Portland where this Tom is from, it's assumed to be Portland, Maine. My fiance grew up in Portland, Oregon, and I quickly learned that uh, most of the country, if you say Portland, is thinking Oregon. I grew up in that little spot in the mid-Atlantic where if someone says they're from Portland, we say, which one? Good to see you, Tom. Oh, night, Al. You joined, too. Another one of my lock picker buddies who said, I would trust you around my building. Well, I'm glad you would trust me around your building. I am, I am the pinnacle of respectability, as you well know. I've never done anything wrong in any building. Any luck tailgating into or out of an elevator? Ask Scott, um, yeah, like elevators are not a sort of situation where anyone really, the, the, the cultural phenomenon of hold that door and someone sticks there, oh yeah, I got the door for you, that's very typical. And if an elevator is already going to a certain floor, it's very uncommon for someone to be like, hey, you're, you're going to seven? I want to see you badge in to seven. Like, it's just not culturally what we do. In fact, we've leveraged that in the past to get to the penthouse level at like Hilton Hotels to get the free snacks and the free cheap wine. You just stand in an elevator long enough, keep placing up calls from like the ninth floor if you're trying to get to 10, and eventually someone's going to be coming by that's going up there anyway, and you just step into the car with them. So tailgating in an elevator, sure. Uh, Barbara, Barbara asks, pet mode? What is that? So it's not nearly as cool as many of us wish it were. Culturally in Japan, from where I understand pet mode uh, is most prevalent, some people choose, because their elevators are smaller as well, some people choose to not want to ride in an elevator with an animal. And pet mode, if you get in the elevator with, let's say, your little dog, such elevator, many buttons, wow, you can trigger pet mode and it shows an indicator light outside is my understanding. It shows other passengers, potential passengers in the building, that there is a dog in the elevator and they may elect to not take that cab if they so desire. I think that is crazy because I would pet every dog and boop them on the snooter in every elevator I could. Dee McBride says, in general, is there something, it seems to me that something isn't secure, who is the best contact? Uh, the building owner, the elevator vendor, 
So yeah, if this is if you're if you notice something is wrong and you're pointing it out, and you say, oh, what? Who do I tell? It's a very common in all of the security industry, right? Like, where do I report this finding? Who's going to listen? It's a mixed bag. If something is not secure in the sense of an unsafe condition, I would talk to like the building facilities manager. Uh, it's not necessarily like if this building has five floors and the top three floors are one company, uh, they might be the biggest tenant in that building, but they're not probably managing the building. Maybe the person at the very front desk downstairs or the person on the deed of the building, like that's who you want to be getting in touch with. If you're ever unclear on a safety issue, try to find out the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction in your region. That is the authority, the party either at the state or local level or sometimes a private entity that is doing the inspections, the safety testing. If you're talking about you found a security condition, like there's supposed to be a badge reader that works but it doesn't actually stop people from getting to the data center, talk to your head of security. Talk to the same person you would talk to if a lock was like missing from a, a door on the side of the building. Like, hey, the, this lock is gone. Somebody want to look at that? The person you would call, I mean, put it on their plate. And they're not going to be happy. They're going to be like, oh, I don't know about elevators. What do you want with elevators? And then maybe they'll call us and we will happily answer their questions. Uh, James also asked about pet mode. Yeah, like uh, I, I am dying to, uh, I'm dying to see pet mode in an elevator, I got to say. Um, I'm planning to go to, to Japan. I think uh, Tara and I are going there in September. Maybe. If I get to Japan, I'm going to tweet some pictures of pet mode. You better believe it. Curtis asks, what was the circular key reader and cutter? Ah, so what you are referring to, I believe, in the industry, we would call that a tubular key. A tubular key, also sometimes known as an ACE key or a Chicago key, that is because the Chicago Lock Company, who is now a division of Compex, they've been acquired, Chicago Lock made the original ACE lock. That was the tubular form factor. It would just be called a tubular pick that we used. Um, you can pick up a tubular pick on a number of vendor sites. The one that we sell, uh, our students, after our classes, if they want more gear, they will go to redteamtools.com. Uh, the one we sell is from a company called Southern Specialties. They've actually recently been acquired by Hardcase Survival. Uh, badass equipment. I love Jeff and Tina at Hardcase and uh, Michelle and Richard from Southern. They, they designed this really nice tubular pick. So you would just look for tubular pick or tubular lock pick. The cutter, there are a few that exist. The one in that photo, it has a fun name. It's called a hurdy-gurdy. Uh, we have a slightly smaller one in our technician field kit that I believe is made by HPC. And it would just be called, either case, it's just called a tubular key cutter. So Tom Williams says, uh, live a couple hours west of Boston. Oh, so yeah, you, oh, you're at Salesforce. Groovy, man. Do you ever work with like uh, N80 or um, like Doozy? They're, they're on the West Coast Salesforce offices. I think um, Fuzzy Knob. He's, he's Salesforce security. You work with their good good crew. They're always down to have fun at cons. Uh, can you tell the story of the rabbit's quick set key operating the oh the fire service? Yes. So Night Owl is referencing a friend of ours from back east, uh, the rabbit, who's one of the lock pickers. He's part of the the New Jersey lock picking crew. New Jersey is a state where the entire state has one key for fire service. Uh, it's, it's a Yale style key. It's, I think it's the 3502 key. Howard will tell me if I'm wrong. It's uh, one key that operates all the fire key locks and the fire key key switches. Uh, the rabbit found out that his key, which was not a Yale key and it was not the fire key, would stick into the locks and would turn. He was able to open locked panels. Howard and I inspected a bunch of fire service switches, found out that they will operate as well. What happened there? For interoperability and maximum compatibility, some of the most popular vendors of key uh, lock hardware and key switch hardware were essentially cutting corners. If you want to see more detail about that, I would recommend you check out the talk that Howard and I presented at the HOPE conference in New York, the 2600 conference. There's a talk called, This Key is Your Key, This Key is My Key. And at the very end of it, this was about key to like systems, at the very end, we showed the story of the key that the rabbit had and we showed how we took the locks apart and the amount of keys we were able to shove in and make them turn in some of these installs was astounding. Brad asks, any useful info on elevator certificates? Is there any good info? Well, there is the smiling face of Sherry Berry, the elevator lady, if you're in North Carolina. Um, that, is, that is an elevator industry joke. Boy, I am getting really reductive and silly with that. But 
so is there any information? Many times nowadays, elevators don't even have the certificate in the cab. Many times it'll just say, this certificate is on file in the office. And it does lead, though, to the anecdote that I will say is if you're a building supervisor, if you're in charge of facilities, have a little oversight there. Make sure if, if you don't know and have a really good relationship with your inspectors that are coming in and doing your work and maintenance, make sure they're actually doing the maintenance, especially with those certs not being posted publicly and there's a log book somewhere in a motor room. Check out your maintenance control program. See if the people who are coming to do your service actually are doing your service or if you have an incident, if you're having a lot of entrapments, if you're having a lot of failures of some kind, get a third party, get someone like, again, you can, I'm not trying to hawk our services here, but call us up, Howard will come out, and have someone evaluate whether the work you're having done is actually being done. There's a lot of non-work taking place. I don't want to say a lot, I'm not criticizing, the industry is mostly very good people, but there have been instances where work was like billed for and was not performed, and someone tagged me, oh yeah, we, we service this, and they really didn't service it. Get a, get a second opinion. Robert asks, oh, he asked about their certificate. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not uh, noticing they're not usually posted anymore. Why? Um, I think that's just part of the reason. It's, it's public, publicly the information doesn't really do much for the public. So they're just keeping those, those certs and those paperwork all on file. Many times it's in the motor room. If you get in the elevator motor room, you'll see the binder in there. Jeff asks, Possibly too in-depth, but I'm about to begin security review meetings with construction manager for a new high-rise. Ooh, that sounds awesome. Where do I start detailing security must-haves or best practices so we don't accidentally build deficiencies in out of naivete? naivete? Um, that is not at all too much of a question, and you're exactly asking it at the right time. Um, this is the kind of thinking you really want to see. As anyone knows, if you're installing a badge reader in an access control system, if you're installing new network infrastructure. You ask before like the walls go up, hey, should we locate this on the edge of the building over here where there's big glass windows or maybe we should put it on the third floor in the middle of the building with no doors. So you're asking the questions at the right time. Essentially what I would say is one, if you can, just take the elevator out of the equation. Construct a, you know, like a sky lobby at whatever the sensitive floor is and vestibule off that landing so that the elevator, even if someone gets up there, they can't go anywhere because there are locked doors on either side of them to get into the offices. That's a number one best way to deal with this. Beyond that, find out exactly what your badge reader system, if you're putting a badge reader in, is or isn't capable of. Find out if you're going to have that little card reader on-off switch. Like, that's not mandatory to behave the way you saw in that video clip. Sometimes you don't have that switch at all. Find out if you have independent service mode on the cabs, and if so, what it's going to do. I have seen situations where independent did not give me a lot of leverage in a building, and I had to use fire service mode. So basically, I mean, the, the answer I'd really say is, when do you want us to come talk to you? We'll come out, we'll have a, we'll, you know, take us out for a cocktail or two, we'll walk around the building with you, and we'll tell you what you need to be thinking about. We'd be happy to have more of a discussion, but hopefully those first few bullet points are something to go on question was specific to elevators themselves. I guess you mean not the, uh, not the like sky lobby vestibuling solution. That really is the best solution. I mean, hands down, I know I keep hitting that, but just don't treat the elevator like it's a security device. Another thing, you know, put cameras in the elevators that are being actively monitored. Some elevator camera systems are local storage in the camera, and like they're only used for review and reconstruction after an incident. Other elevator cameras can actually have a feed going through the traveling cable, and it's part now. How often do people actually monitor security cameras in a building? Well, that's a training and personnel issue, but you can you can add that in. You can absolutely this is like another great one. You can absolutely have monitoring of your elevator controller without putting that controller on the internet. You don't need an outdated Windows XP box up in the machine room. You can have monitoring boards, add-on boards that go in the controller cabinet, and they're, for example, the logic you could have is independent service mode. If for any reason independent service mode, which is just a dry contact, you know, switch, if this contact closes, send an alert down this wire. If the elevator is running on inspection service, send an alert down this wire. Your access control system in a building is taking all kinds of inputs from motion sensors and door sensors, you could literally have something like 
if the elevator latches a call and is going to the tenth floor, and this call was not immediately preceded by a valid badge credential, register an alert. Like, that's not your elevator system doing that logic, but your elevator system is throwing some information out to your access control system that you maybe could configure, just like your server room. If your server room door sensor says the door is open and it was not preceded by a badge credential or a motion sensor on the inside, it'll register an event, a condition like a forced door condition or an emergency condition. You could put that sort of logic chaining in with various elevator sensor inputs if you have these add-on boards. In your opinion, Robert asks, what new feature would improve elevator security? Huh. I've never thought of it like that because my thinking, it's, that's like saying what new feature would make a chef's knife less likely to cut your hand if you're in the kitchen? Well, it's not really a feature of the chef's knife, right? Like you want the knife to be sharp and cut things. The knife being sharp isn't the problem. It's how you're using it that's a problem. So I don't envision elevators as having features that are the security problem. I think people per repurposing the elevator's features as if they are security lockouts is the problem. And consequently, yeah, if, uh, if people would just stop treating the elevator like it's part of the security, that would be great. That, that would be wonderful. The feature would be different thinking about elevators. Beyond that, I'd like to see more deployment of those uh, add-on third-party monitoring circuits. Uh, you don't see a lot of them because, again, it's it's a pain in the butt. You have to have a separate contractor come out who knows what he or she is doing. And, and you're, then you're calling up your integrator who installed your access control system and, hey, we've got a few more wires that we're going to pull over. Can you chain this logic together? But I'd like to see more of that. If, if people insist on thinking these elevators are secure, at least be monitoring where the heck they're going in the building. Let's see. I don't see any more questions. And we're, we're already uh, about 15 minutes longer than your average webcast. I'm super happy you guys hung with us for this long. Anybody have a last minute statement? Thank you so much, says Barbara. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you to everyone for watching. This was a whole lot of fun. Uh, I love what I do. I love the job I have. I really enjoy getting to work with this team. And if there's anything we can ever do for you, please go ahead and give us a call. Send us an email. Find us on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about this, definitely come to our classes at SANS. We'd love to see you in Austin. Uh, we'd love to see you in Orlando and everywhere else that we're going to be. So, yeah, hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much, Deviant, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.